Welcome to Keeping Your Email List um, Healthy This Spring. I am Monica Hoyer. I'm the Marketing Director at Influence. Um, Influence is a, email, a marketing automation platform that is, um, allows you to send emails, send SMS, um, do all of the wonderful things that you need to do in order to keep in touch with your subscribers. I'm also going to close this and um, turn the music off so that you guys can hear me um, a little bit better. And but we will have a link to um, in the follow up um, to a list cleaning um, Spotify playlist if you're interested in hearing some more songs and I'll play another okay. one at the end. Um, so welcome to both Jack and Jenna from Webula. I appreciate you joining today. I'm, I'm right. super excited about this topic. It's, it's always been, um, you know, kind of a conversation piece in email marketing about what to do with your list. Do you clean it? Do you not clean it? Do you rely on your email service provider? Do you use an outside service? So I'm really excited to get things started and, and talk to you guys about this today. I will, um, start who wants to start? Jenna, I think we're going to start off with you, do some introductions. Sure. Um, so I'll, over to you. All right. Uh, first, thank you, Monica and Influence for having uh, Jack and I today. Uh, my name is Jenna Devinney. I am the content marketing manager here at Webula. Um, I've been here a little over four years now and also the first um, job right out of school. Okay. And uh, all I can say is I'm absolutely obsessed with the email industry and I'm happy I fell into it. So welcome awesome. awesome yeah we love jenna uh, my <laughs> name is jack wrigley i am uh, the vp of partners for uh, webula um, i'm fairly new to webula as a company but have uh, been involved in email verification and deliverability uh, tool sets for the better part of uh, seven or eight years now and so i do have a, a pretty strong opinion on the matter but <laughs> uh, thoroughly uh, thrilled to be here and thanks so much for having us Awesome. Wonderful. I am going to stop sharing because I think um, most folks are already here. And um, sorry, let me just get organized here. Um, so, you know, when we were kind of talking about this, um, this webinar, we were discussing all the wonderful things about list cleaning and also all the difficult things about list cleaning. Um, and we wanted to kick things off and ask the audience, what, how often do you clean your list? So folks um, in the audience, please feel free to respond to this poll that we have up here um, while we kick things off um, awesome. with our questions. I love this. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll share these results with you guys um, once Great. we've got a, a good number of folks responding, but it looks like answers are still rolling in here. So we're just going to get the conversation started and I'm going to start off with you, Jenna. Talk to us about how often you should clean your list because people are responding, but um, I want to I want to hear from from you guys like what what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of watching the results come in as we're speaking and I'm um, not surprised, but I think the answer is a little bit twofold. Uh, if you're sending um, regularly and you're reviewing your metrics regularly, I think the best answer for that would be clean your list regularly, maybe quarterly. Um, but if you're bringing in email addresses with protected forms like Webula's API um, and catching you know, these um, bad email addresses at the front door, um, I would say annually. Okay, great. Um, Jack, anything you want to add to that? No, it's, uh, you know, first and foremost, like Jenna said, pay attention to the metrics coming off your ESP because that would be a great uh, guidepost. Um, send relevant email. That's so important. And then create a cadence so the person that's receiving your email understands kind of what the cadence is. All of those types of things will just uh, make your email program much better and um, really reduce some of that, uh, that bad data that might be in there. Um, obviously, selfishly, I, I would like to answer. I think you should do it daily. That's probably not, not <laughs> right, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, quarterly is good. Um, and again, like Jenna mentioned, it really just depends on your acquisition strategy. If you have, you know, a form that uh, isn't protected in any way, shape or form, you know, there's ways that you can verify at the point of capture. There's ways to verify 
you know, some kind of cadence before those email addresses make it into your database. Um, but in general, quarterly is a, is a really good rule of thumb to go with. Awesome. Yeah, good stuff. Okay, I'm going to end this poll now and, and share the results with everyone so everybody can see kind of where they landed. Um, quarterly and once a year are the most popular. Um, I do appreciate the people who were completely honest with us <laughs> and shared that they never clean their list. And list cleaning, what's that? Um, uh, you know, okay. honesty is always the best policy. So <laughs> I'm glad you've joined us today to learn a little bit more about why you might want to clean your list um, and what cleaning list cleaning it really is. So next question back to you also, Jenna, on this one. Um, what happens if you neglect managing your list? Sure. Uh, simple. Uh, your ROI is impacted um, and you will deliver far less email than you actually think you're delivering. So let's say your target is B2B. Uh, think about how many people change jobs and you're still sending to them. They're not even there. Um, you know, just people abandon emails or just are not really active. So um, if you continue continually, you know, regularly clean your list, then, um, you know, that's going to help for sure. Um, an example that I have that I like to use a lot is um, temporary domains. You know, there's people out there that use a, um, a temporary domain to sign up for a coupon or a discount. Well, those those emails are temporary, like they, they're called. Uh, they only happen for a few minutes to get that, that coupon or that discount, and um, then they're gone, but they're stuck in your list, and you're still sending to them, and they're not giving you any activity, and there goes your deliverability. So um, that's kind of what happens when high level of what happens when you neglect your list. Um, so Jenna, that brought up, a, that brings up a really great point. I, um, I'm an iPhone user and now when I fill out a form, it says hide my email and, um, it tells me, Apple tells me exactly what the email address is and they will even forward that email address to my regular Gmail account or my work account, whichever one I use. What do you see happening with those? Has that influenced kind of what's happening with lists at all? You know, I don't, I don't know enough about Jack. Do you have the answer to that? A better answer? I'm not sure. Well, all of, all of those things can get, I mean, at the end of the day, what you're managing with a list is an actual email address. And so if something happens or is manipulated to that email address, it can, you know, throw off a lot of metrics that you might otherwise use to measure the overall effectiveness of your, your campaigns and things of that nature. Um, but you know, unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot you can do about that because it's, you know, Apple is doing their thing. Uh, won't be surprised if others don't start doing their thing. So it's really incumbent upon us to kind of fall back on the basics. And that is um, send relevant email. Mm -hmm. um, watch the reaction, watch the metrics as people, you know, click, open, read, reach out, you know, engage with that, that email. All of those things really will help you define and, and drive your program versus worrying about, gosh, did, did Apple adjust the email address and you know, hide it? So right. um, even if it's hidden, there's still activity that you can, you can measure. It may not be an open and a click, but you can still find ways to measure that activity through purchases and things of that nature. All right. Good point. Great. Yep. Um, thank you. So um, next question, how would you recommend handling those inactive subscribers, which kind of relates back to that last question, Jack? Yeah. I'm going to turn to you for that one first. Yeah, this is such an interesting question because there's um, there's so many differing opinions. And I think that as email marketers, we sometimes get so hung up on, um, you know, did a person click on it? Did they open it? When in fact, quite frankly, I know I do this all the time. Email comes into my, my inbox. I'll read the subject line and move on. Mm -hmm. If the subject line, it doesn't mean I'm, I don't want the email for maybe the sporting goods store, but maybe that subject line is you know, a discount for something that I just don't need. So for me to open that email address and start looking and reading, it's just not gonna happen. But that impression was made, right? So I think it's I think it's a really valuable thing to, to keep in mind that if somebody hasn't explicitly asked to be um, you know taken off the list, then there's probably ways that you can manage those people to make sure that they still want your email. You can send them an email that says, "Hey, we haven't heard from you in a while. You still interested? 
and, and have some fun with it and let them give you the opportunity to either say yes or no. And, mm -hmm. and if they say yes, then, you know, they just may not be active, but they still appreciate your email. And then you can potentially create a different cadence for them. But um, just because they're inactive isn't necessarily a bad thing is my right. bottom line. So, yeah, I agree with you. And in fact, um, we were having this discussion internally um, just a couple of weeks ago and our yeah. CEO said he goes to a guitar store and, you know, every 10 years he buys a guitar or whatever the cadence <laughs> is, but right. he stays subscribed to those newsletters because sure. when he's in the market for guitar, he wants the coupon code. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just as you said, just because somebody's inactive doesn't necessarily mean they're not going to be in the market at some point. So leave them on your right. list potentially, or ask them in a re-engagement campaign. Yeah. Um, talk to me about like cadence of cleaning that, like doing a re-engagement campaign. So we talked about just cleaning your list using a service right. like Webula, but doing right. a re-engagement campaign, is that something um, you recommend on a weekly basis? Probably not. Um, no, you know, is yeah. it something once a year, every six months, every quarter? Again, um, um, I don't. I don't think it's uh, you know out of bounds to you know consider just taking the temperature of your your email uh, list and all the people that belong to that. To take the temperature every six months, maybe every nine months, just to have some fun and let them, you know, show that you re recognize that they're human beings, um, show that you're a company that might have some empathy and just, you know, is everything good? You know, are we still friends? Can we still continue to, you know, email each other? I mean, there's so many cool ways that you can do that, that um, aren't offensive. Don't come across as, oh gosh, you're just hitting me up too much. Um, but then also give you some really good feedback in terms of, yeah, kind of like the guitar scenario. I love what you're doing. I just don't buy a guitar every, you know, every other month. So could, I think. Could you uh, imagine if, if, could you imagine if you did? <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah. Well, I'd probably have other issues. <laughs> but, but I think the, you know, the point there is I don't think there's a silver bullet answer for that. Um, I do think that, you know, as email marketers, we just need to always remember people are human beings. And, you know, sending an email is not a whole lot different than, you know, reaching out to someone in other ways, just yeah. reach out and ask them from time to time if, uh, if they've been quiet, say, is, you know, can we still be friends or, you know, have some fun with it. There's so many creative ways to probably do that. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Jenna, I'm going to switch over to you now. Um, what, what could people be doing besides cleaning their list to keep their database or their, yeah, their people um, healthy and um, not piss off their email service provider. <laughs> Can I actually chime in on the last question real quick? Cause I actually oh, sure. reference something um, cause I've talked about inactive subscribers a lot or just interviewed people just being on the content side of Webula. And um, we recently came out with an inactive ask the expert blogs um, series based off Jordi Van Rijen. I always butcher that and Steve yeah. Henderson. Um, they went back and forth on LinkedIn. So I know this is a hot topic. And um, after asking experts, the two most common answers were it depends on how you um, define inactives as a company, you know, your business model, your, your customer relationship right. and your cycle and email program. So one, it's just based on how you define it. And the other common answer between all of them was, um, you know, send those re-engagement campaigns. Now, I'm not opposed to that. I think that's a good um, idea. But I think um, Lauren McDonald, if you don't know him, he wrote for us last year in our metric series about inactive subscribers. And he had three takeaways that I absolutely love. One was to define your inactives. Two was find the root cause of the inactivity before you have to even send the re-engagement campaigns. You know, like if there's inactivity after two weeks of an opt-in, that's probably because there was a discount and offer that they really wanted. If it was two months later and there's a lot of like a high percentage of inactivity, then there's definitely probably something wrong with your email program that you need to fix. But, um, and then the third point that he made was develop proactive strategies to minimize the subscribers from going inactive. So one, fix the problem. There might be an issue in your opt-in page. It hasn't been updated. Uh, experiment with your frequency, your segmentation, your personalization. Um, the other thing is I think Jack mentioned was expectation. If you're putting something on your landing page, 
they expect to get that what they signed up for. So if it's not in line, then that's something you need to fix. And then I'm actually shocked that Jack didn't bring this up, but I always reference when we talk about inactives is Della. Della talks about the billboard effect. Um, I absolutely right. love that. Um, I'm actually, like you talked about the guitar, uh, I'm a victim of this. I don't know how many times I go to like, let's say Old Navy, and I never really open emails, but I know Old Navy is sending me an email almost every day with a, with a coupon or a discount. And when I go into Old Navy and I don't see one because I'm like opted out of their list because they took me out because I haven't been inactive, I'm not happy. So that's just kind of my two cents into that, that answer. <laughs> Uh, that, I, the, the same thing happens to me with Michaels and I'll go on to their website while I'm standing in line to get their coupon, get the coupon. because I don't see they've taken me off their list or it's gone to my junk because I don't open it often enough or whatever it might be. So I completely agree with you, Jenna. There, there is a good, a time and a place. And, and at the end of the day, as we talk about in the email industry, it's all about being in the inbox at the right time and the right place from, especially from that um, B2C standpoint. Um, on the B2B standpoint, it's true also. Like, you know, for me, I'm, I'm doing research on different content topics. I think Jenna, you do too. And saying, what is the industry talking about? And so I want those industry newsletters at certain times, but then there are other times when I'm like, I, I'm flooded with, with data and information, I just can't, I can't do it right now. And so I just don't read them. So it is really about that right time and right place. And, and it's hard to pinpoint that. And it's on a case by case basis. It's person yeah. by person. So um, that, that's a great point. So um, Jenna, the, the next question then I'll, I'll repeat it is what can I be doing besides cleaning my list to keep my database healthy? Kind of what I mentioned in my previous answer, um, just send what the, your subscribers are expecting, what they want, relevant content. Um, uh, of course, you know, if they're inactive, you can do those re-engagement campaigns or pinpoint, you know, why they're being inactive before it kind of with the first signs of it um, and then separate them out. And, uh, but I think the other thing is uh, protect yourself at the front door um, and in, enable an API on your forms to make sure that they're not getting in your list first. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, I love that. And, you know, so many companies will just allow anything in um, and you have to be really careful with that for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, Jack, Jack, did you want to fill uh, no, just, to that? I, I think one of the pieces that sometimes is missed in this whole verification, cleaning of email lists and things of that nature is it's really important to look at the data and potentially kind of go back in time and understand how that bad data ended up in your database to begin with. Mm -hmm. Typically, it all comes back to just a poor acquisition strategy. And that could be fixed, like Jenna said, by you know, enabling an API like Webula's API on the front end of a form to ensure that you know, that data is accurate and correct when, when the customer gives it to you. Because a lot of times, I mean, if you think about just you standing in line at uh, Michael's and you know, you're using a an iPhone or something of that nature, it's very easy to fat finger and put in, you know, bad information, which if it makes it into a database, it can start affecting everything and all of your metrics and everything else that's going on in that, uh, you know, that process. So take the data and take some time and try to step back and go, how is this getting in? How is this happening? Not just, just don't take it from the perspective of, oh, I'm going to separate this out and then send my campaign. Obviously you should do that, but really take the information and understand why is it getting in in the first place? Yeah, awesome. Really important. Yeah, I agree with you. So um, Jenna, back to you on, how do you know which provider, because there are a lot of list cleaning providers out there. How do you know which one's right for you and your situation? Sure. Um, I think if you find what, two or three, uh, recommend testing uh, the providers against each other. Uh, most providers offer a free test, so the results speak for themselves. Um, that would be my number one um, answer for that. But not just the results, but think about the, the interface itself. Um, how does the look and feel? Is it easy to maneuver? The features, the features are exactly what you need. Uh, security is really big. And then um, fourth is the support. Are they active um, when you need them to be? Um, and the other thing I always like to say is um, 
don't just don't just choose the cheapest because it's the cheapest. I mean, you get what you pay for. So that's my my response yeah. to that. <laughs> I no, totally nothing agree. To add. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well then, Jack, I'm going to throw this next one out to you. Sure. If, if I'm sending through a reputable ESP, yeah, yeah. more than likely they're bound, they're removing my bounces, they're right. removing my undeliverables. Why then do I need to clean my list? Well, from a from a web field perspective, there's there's I think the short answer is you know traditional verification companies will simply verify an email address as to whether or not it's deliverable or undeliverable. And that's the simplest thing that, that most verification companies do. And you're right, a lot of ESPs, if they're reputable, are handling much of that function for you. However, where Webula takes the next step is we take a look at your deliverable email addresses. So the, the threats and the issues typically are inside what everybody says is deliverable good to go. It's not on the bounced or undeliverable email address. If it were that simple, that would be a solution. But the reality is, the threat and the, the, the worst part of what can damage your reputation and cause you all kinds of problems are residing in that deliverable email address. So even if an ESP is removing your bounces, even if you use simple verification to remove a bounce or an undeliverable, there's a high degree of probability that you could potentially still be sending to a deliverable email address that is still a massive issue. So mm. that's why you want to leverage a, a product like Webula. Okay, that we, makes sense. we do have a, yeah. yeah, it does. And we do have a cool. question that came in, but I want to kind of um, dive a little bit deeper into that simple sure. verification um, mention that you had. So talk to me a little bit more about what the difference between simple verification and then what Webula does. Yeah, thanks. That's that's really, it's, in, it's important. So simple verification, basically in theory, will communicate to an email server that email server then will reply as to whether or not that is a deliverable or undeliverable email address. What we do is take that a step further and we apply um, kind of an analysis on top of deliverable email addresses where we search for over 50 different threat vectors. And if those threats are flagged, we then categorize those into four different categories so that the email marketer can understand, you know, is this a reputation threat? Is this a deliverability threat? Is this a, a conversion threat? And so on. We have technology that will help uncover some of that information so that you can look at it. And again, you can take that information and go, why is this getting in here? You can go back in time and understand what are my acquisition strategies? Where is that happening? Most importantly though, it goes beyond just simple verification and it helps you have an, uh, some insight in the overall deliverability of your email list and of the email addresses that you have been acquiring. And it gives you a snapshot before you hit send. If you, can, if you can look at it before you hit send and make some corrections, then everything post send starts to take care of itself much better in terms of ROI and all of those things. So Webula is all about email verification, but then we have this threat detection layer that sits on top that will help you analyze and categorize all of your email addresses into different uh, threat categories to help you become you know, better at what you do. Awesome. That, that's mm -hmm. great. Um, I'm going to uh, circle back to Jenna. The question that came in um, was around that testing um, answer that you gave us, you know, test a bunch of different providers. And the question comes from Nick. Um, and Nick asked, when testing providers for list cleaning slash verification, how long do you use as your trial period to test their effectiveness? Is it three months? Is it six months? What's your recommendation? Um, that's yeah. a good question. Uh, Jack, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's just like a one and done thing our data solutions team does. You can kind of tell the difference between. Yeah. From there. I mean, literally, if you if you leverage Webula's technology, you'll know instantly and you'll see the, the instant benefit of it. Mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, that goes for just simple email verification as well. You can quickly determine whether or not an email address is deliverable or undeliverable. Um, but there isn't a long protracted time frame needed in order to determine the effectiveness unless there unless there's a couple of things going on so for example you might want to um, you know leverage our API on a form and you might want to see how um, you know the the process on that form 
uh, interacts with the customer? Does it slow them down from, from achieving what you want the form to, to do? Does it, does it cause any kind of issues? So there, there are things you can test that aren't necessarily based on how great is Webulus technology, for example, because that's instant. But there are things you can test depending on how you're leveraging our technology to determine, is it the right workflow? Is it, is it moving the customer through kind of an experience that they want or is it slowing them down? For example, you know, a lot of people love talking about uh, reCAPTCHA, right? It's, it's awesome, but, but the downside of that is it slows down the conversion and can slow down and it becomes kind of a pain for somebody to sit there and pick all the stop signs before they get in to buy your goods, right? Super effective, but the user experience kind of lacks. And so there's things that you can do depending on how you leverage our technology to maybe focus more in on user experience. And that could be measured maybe over time. But in terms of how, how good the technology is, that's virtually instant. Mm -hmm. okay. Great. Um, another question's come in here from Karen. And Karen, I'm going to rephrase this slightly. Does size matter? <laughs> um, so her question is, you know, should a list be a certain size in order for the cleansing or the hygiene to be impactful? Um, you know, my, my answer is no. I mean, yeah. you know, at the, at the, you know, list size is, you know, again, there's so many subjective and, and different ways to look at things within the email industry. And you might have a small list size because you're just starting. And it's really important to potentially, you know, leverage Webulus technology to help you understand, again, what are my acquisition methods to even get a small list? Is, is it working? Does it seem to be preventing the, the bad things from ending up in my, my, my email database? Um, and sometimes, you know, list size can just be, you know, based on the, the type of business you are and the type of customers that you have. You know, there's lots of little niche areas out there that have you know, 5,000 people that love, you know, $700,000 home speakers, you know, that's not for everybody. So their list size might be small, but by the same token, they're still acquiring those email addresses somewhere. So it's really important to leverage technology like Webula to help you um, maintain and have the best list possible. Okay, great. Quality, quality over quantity, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, that's, so... That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> Jenna knows how to just bring it down. <laughs> um, okay, so um, a couple more questions here. What kind of email threats, Jenna, should email marketers be aware of or looking out for? Sure. Um, you know, you can't necessarily look out for an email threat. So Jack had a really good explanation between simple verification and email threat detection with what Webula does. Um, so four threats that come off the top of my head are uh, that would pass a simple verification check um, would be like bots, temporary domains, block listed emails, and duplicates. Those are all uh, would pass an active verification test. So, um, and they could be just hiding in your, your email list as we know it. So it's always good to right. kind of get an extra layer of intelligence to, to um, be sure that those aren't in your list. Got it, awesome. Yeah. All right, so um, Jack, over to you for this next question, unless you wanted to add anything yeah. to, to Jenna's answer there. No, I think what's really uh, kind of cool is, you know, we, we have roughly 50 different threats that we analyze against. The thing that is important to understand is it, it's not every threat that is out there. It is not meant to be a silver bullet that makes everything perfect, but it is important to understand that those 50 threats have been developed over a decade. You know, White has been in business for a long time. We started out as an email service provider and we ran into the same issues that everybody runs into. And we started building our own technology to combat those issues. And that technology became just more interesting and what people wanted over just the platform of sending an email. So there was this, uh, through that process, we have um, literally, um, by being an ESP, we have helped kind of understand, and at least from our own perspective, and come up with the threats that we feel are, are meaningful. Um, but again, it doesn't mean it's everything, because the you know email is, is challenging that way. But are, there are very important threats to, to take a look at and you know monitor and, and understand against your database, for sure. Okay, 
Um, and so one more question here. Um, well, it's about 1230. We're halfway through or we're 30 minutes in, I should say. Um, we will stay here and answer any questions that the audience has. So folks continue to, to answer questions, but or to send us some questions. But um, I only have one other question for you, Jack. Um, and this one I'm going to start with you is how important is email activity to a sender? Oh, I think email activity is really important. Um, I'm not convinced that senders truly necessarily watch it um, all of the time. And I'm not convinced that that data is always, you know, front and center to a sender, you know, through their ESP and things of that nature. Um, but here's the deal. If your email list is made up of primarily um, email addresses that uh, were first seen 30 days ago, probably a problem, right? So that 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 type of data could be really handy. In other words, that that could be, you know, bot attack it could be a lot of different things. If your email address uh, list is, um, you know, made up of email addresses that were first seen more than a year ago, that's important. Um, if you have an email list that has, you know, activity, you know, it's, it's relatively active over the last 30 days, or it's really not active over the last 30 days, that can be really important information for an email marketer to understand in terms of how to craft the right message to those types of folks and really understand who makes up their uh, email database. So I think it's important. Okay, awesome. Uh, Jenna, anything to add there? No, you nailed it. Okay, great. Um, we do have another question and I, I might um, ask Warren to expand on this. Um, Warren, um, would you mind if I allowed you to talk and join us in this um, conversation? Because I'd like um, you to kind of expand on this question you asked, which was, are there some quality B2B list sources you would recommend healthcare specific? Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Uh, there are a lot of list companies out there. And uh, when you acquire some data, you usually find maybe 50% of it's accurate and the other 50% is not. And then identifying which 50% is good versus not is rather challenging, time consuming, costly. So when I posed that question to you, do you have certain sources that you might recommend within, I'll just say business to business services that you have come across that have good quality data? My particular business is more in the healthcare area. So I was trying to be more specific than general. So um, my question back to you might be, um, you're acquiring this list. So you're purchasing a list essentially. I have, I, we have our own database of 30 years, but if we want to continue to build and expand that, then yes, where do we acquire additional data? that would complement our existing data. Um, okay, so from an email service provider standpoint, um, we would recommend you use that for remarketing efforts and things like that and try and get folks to sign up for your list organically through um, you know, using that list on Google to remarket your or market your newsletter, using it on social media to market your newsletter, things like that, rather than actually sending to them because they haven't opted into your list. Uh, so this starting point sounds like direct mail in order for them to learn about our services to opt in to begin with? Yes. Yeah, because essentially you want them to say, raise their hand and say, yes, I'm interested in whatever your company is right. offering. Um, I think uh, you can Jack, use social media as well. I mean, there's yeah. you can use LinkedIn, you can use uh, Facebook, you can use, um, the point is, is to um, market to those folks something that they want to opt in before you hit send of an email. That That's really, really critical in the, world that we live yep that's why well, most folks uh, we, we just don't uh, typically you know suggest you buy lists or rent lists or do anything of that nature um, because you know you just pointed out most of the data is junk anyway yeah that, that's right. the starting point but then you have uh, potentially other issues uh, for example you know california's law is very very strict around that anymore and 
you don't, I mean, if you're acquiring a list and that's got a bunch of California residents in it, watch out. Um, I mean, that's not a place you, you really want to go. Yeah. And you can't necessarily tell that from an email address. Sure. No. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Warren, for your, for your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've got another question here from um, Caitlin. And Caitlin asks, does cadence matter in list cleaning? Does someone who send an email monthly need to clean as often as someone who sent daily or weekly? And I think, um, Jenna, you you kind of touched on that briefly at the beginning of the conversation. Do you want to right. expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, I, I think probably that since they're so close in timing, I think that they could probably cleanse almost the same time, uh, monthly and daily, weekly. So that's for the short answer. That's, that's what I would say. So if you're sending a daily email, you might want to cleanse more often, but if you're only sending a monthly newsletter, then cleaning less often is probably okay. I think, uh, I don't know, Jack, I, my recommendation would be quarterly for both options because yeah. I mean, they're not sending that often. So that would be my, my response to that. Yeah. So, so I think that, um, again, this all gets back to kind of email acquisition. So for example, when I see, does cadence matter in list cleaning? You know, if you're, if you're sending regularly, um, that's the best way to, to really monitor your, your list and, and pay attention to the metrics and all of those things. The problem is, is that you're typically not sending to the same people over and over and over and over again. Your list grows. And mm -hmm. as your list grows, you should, you should be doing at least one thing. And that is any new acquisition of an email address, you should absolutely figure out a way to leverage a Webula service, such as okay. use our API on the form. So that as that is provided to you, we do our magic. It then comes in and you're good to go. If you don't do something like that, then what I would recommend is verify your entire database once and then at least on a monthly or quarterly basis, depending on how fast email addresses are coming into your database, then take anything new and verify that on that same cadence. Okay. So it's not so much about how much you're sending, it's how fast that acquisition is of those email addresses. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. Caitlin, I hope that answered your question. And um, if anybody else has questions, it's about 1235. Great. Caitlin says, yes, we did answer a question. Fantastic. Um, if anybody else has questions, feel free to ask us. We're here. Um, the other option, also, if you're feeling shy, I won't promote you to talk. Um, but if you're feeling shy and want to connect one on one with any of us, you can find us all on LinkedIn. Um, and you can also find us through our websites. Um, Influence's website is influence.com or emarketingplatform.com, which is our marketing automation platform. Influence is our, um, our full service digital agency. Um, both, both operations are based out of Kansas City. I am here based out of North Durham, North Carolina. Um, and I've got uh, Jenna and Jack, do one of you wanna speak a little bit about Webula and how to reach, get in touch with you guys? Sure. Sure. Go ahead, yeah, Jenna. go ahead, Jenna. <laughs> go ahead. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can reach us at, uh, you know, find us at webula.com. That's W-E-B-B-U-L-A.com. Um, you are welcome to uh, connect with either myself or Jenna on LinkedIn and have a conversation there. Um, and we're more than happy to, uh, you know, continue to discuss challenges that you might have and try to provide you guidance and, and real world solutions, not just sell a product. Um, you know, we're all in this together at the end of the day. And um, it's really important that we all, you know, become better stewards of email and better senders of email. So we're here all the time, depending on how you want to get hold of us. Yep. The email industry is a, is a small space. So, you it know, is. we all know each other one way or another. Um, <laughs> thank you guys. I appreciate it. Um, we've gotten some us. thanks some thanks in the chat as well. 
Um, appreciate everybody for joining us today. And for those of us who are watching, those of you who are watching the recording, um, we hope you got some value out of this and, and you are also welcome to engage with us um, offline uh, and through our websites. I am going to play some Fats Waller to wrap up. Um, he's got a song about spring cleaning. So um, appreciate again, all of your time and energy and um, always enjoy talking to the folks at Webula. So thank you guys. Thanks everybody. <laughs>